Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Mary Pearl. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at Macaulay. And uh, I'd like to say that Macaulay is a wonderful institution which accepts the cleverest test takers New York has to offer. <laughs> and over four years, it's a wonderful time to observe the transformation of really smart young people into leaders. And uh, so we really celebrate student initiative. And I just want to take a, a moment to thank Shakima and her team um, as we celebrate diversity here this morning. <laughs> One of my greatest pleasures here is watching students turn vision into action on issues that matter. And no one supports this more than our own Drew Adair, who has spent 20 years uh, supporting student um, activities. And it's telling that in his brief tenure here, we've gone from uh, four student clubs to 21. And uh, I asked, I check in with Drew because, you know, we're colleagues. So how, how are you managing this? And his answer is, it's crazy wonderful. <laughs> and if any of you, of you know Drew, I'm thinking, that sounds like a, a, a cabaret song. I'd love to hear Drew sing. Anyway, I welcome the incomparable Drew Adair. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, well, first of all, welcome all, to all of you here to Macaulay Honors College. Um, yes, in uh, two and a half years here, it has been my pleasure to see uh, this place just explode with activity, and um, I'm glad to be a part of it, but I could not be doing what I do without the students that are here um, and some amazing colleagues, in fact, all amazing colleagues that are here uh, that work with you. One thing that I would like to do before I uh, introduce Shakima is to ask those uh, students and staff who are on the planning committee for this, if you could please stand up just so everybody can at least get a look at you, and thank you in that way. Thank you all very much. Just an amazing group of very hardworking, dedicated, enthusiastic uh, young adults who are helping us older adults uh, get, get some uh, things on the table that really need to be discussed and, and really continue to need to be discussed. Uh, and, and to take then a, a step backwards, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Shakima Dockery came uh, to myself and my colleague Mike Lamb. If you want to give a little wave there, Mike Lamb. Um, Basically coming to us saying, you know, there are issues that are affecting certainly Macaulay students of color, uh, particularly uh, given that this is such a high achieving and uh, really a spotlight type of, of program uh, now within the U.S., particularly in the last few years. Uh, and the, these issues that stu students are dealing with uh, really cross uh, all campuses. Um, and as she was finding out, as she was doing some of her research, uh, both in terms of sort of, you know, official data collection kinds of things, but also really just talking to her fellow students, talking to students at other campuses, uh, that these are issues uh, that students are dealing with uh, really across the country um, and things that still have not fully been addressed or are not fully addressed enough. Uh, and she basically gave Mike and I the challenge uh, to say, you know, I'm ready to work on this. Are you ready to support me? And we had no choice but to say absolutely. Uh, you know, definitely. So let me give just a little bit of an introduction of uh, Shakima, who I am sorry to say uh, is graduating this year, so we will be uh, sort of saying farewell, but we know she's going to stick close by, and uh, even if she doesn't, we're going to grab her and make sure she's close by on every level. Uh, so Shakima is a senior now at Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College. Uh, she studies Africana, Puerto Rican, Latino studies, and public policy. She's currently conducting research in both of these fields. Uh, she has worked with various nonprofit and student-centered organizations to promote diversity and awareness about issues in education, including the Ford Foundation, Let's Get Ready, the Latino Youth for Higher Education Program, Harlem Children's Zone, and the CUNY Blackmail Initiative. Uh, she's a Mellon Mays Fellow. She is dedicated uh, to advocating for equality, plans to pursue similar work in her future career. And uh, one new honor, uh, we were very happy this year we sort of started a very, very nice uh, senior recognition event and uh, had a number of, of awards that really recognized a lot of the accomplishments that many of our students 
uh, have done. And Shakima was the recipient of our very first Spirit of Macaulay Award uh, for her work in this and all of her other enthusiastic work in really um, getting students and faculty and administrators to pay attention to these issues. So without any further ado, let me bring up the amazing Shakima Docker. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Morning. First, I would like to start by publicly thanking the Diversity Initiative team, whose hard work and dedication was admirable throughout this whole process, and especially Anna Billingsley and Caitlin O'Hagan, who are back there and whose organizational, whose organiza organizational skills kept me on track this whole entire time. Um, and also all the freshmen and sophomores who joined us this year, bringing fresh new ideas and perspective to this initiative. Um, during the planning of the conference this year, during January, I took a little hiatus and went to Cuba for two weeks. Um, and while I was there, I attended this wonderful lecture, and I wanted to share with you all a story from it. So recently in Cuba's history, um, it had extreme, extreme economic disparity um, when the Soviet Union fell. It provided over 70% of Cuba's goods and resources. So when it fell, Cuba was kind of in shock, in economic shock. Resources were very scarce, like food, um, and they couldn't afford luxuries like cups. So they were basically surviving off of sugar water. And our lecturer, Elmo Hernandez, told us this story, that because they couldn't afford things like cups, um, in order to make them, they would cut a glass Coca-Cola bottle in half, smooth out the edges, and use that as a cup. And similarly, to make wine glasses, they would cut a Coca-Cola bottle in half, flip it upside down, put it over the bottom of a jar. And then the question came up, why would they need wine glasses? What, what would they use them for? And um, our lecturer Elmo told us that there was no wine on the island at all, but Cubans made the wine glasses, not because there was wine, but because they deserved wine. And today, I, want, I would like for everyone to use the tools that we learn here to make crude cups to survive in CUNY, but also to make wine glasses to plan for the CUNY that we all deserve. Um, and And now I would like to introduce our moderator for today. He's a good friend and an ally, a junior at Hunter, a philosophy major, um, and he's been wonderful throughout this whole process, and he will be moderating the keynote panel. Um, but one thing before that, can everyone maybe take a shift to the right so as people come in, as latecomers come in, they can just sit on the end without disrupting. Thank you. I love that how even we're having a conference and we've already begun, Shaheem is already planning. <laughs> Just like her nature, and this is why she's had a successful initiative here, so I'd like to thank her once again. My name is Kwame Yorkin, and I'm a junior here at Macaulay Honors College or Hunter College, and I'd just like to welcome you all and welcome you at home, who um, are watching via a wonderful live stream, um, to our second annual Supporting Excellence Conference. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we are Twitter-friendly this year, so feel free to send any and all questions pertaining to the conference or anything that we discuss um, on Twitter, and our hashtag is hashtag Supporting Excellence. And that's been supported, um, that's been created and, and pushed forward by Caitlin O'Hagan. So I'd like to thank her once again for making that possible. Um, and before we begin, I'm going to have each of the panelists give us a brief introduction of who they are and what they've done um, so that we can get acclimated to the discussions that we'll have today. So please, first, Jeff LeBlanc. Good morning. My name is Jeff LeBlanc. I am a I use my teacher voice. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a dad, two young kids, so I'm on our project. <laughs> I'm a professor at Hunter College School of Education, where I also serve as the chair of the Department of Educational Foundations and Counseling Programs. Uh, primarily, I work. I'm a developmental psychologist by training, so I teach primarily psychology courses, child development, adolescent development, educational psychology for students who are interested in becoming a teacher. Uh, in my department, we also have programs in counseling mental health counseling, rehabilitation counseling, and school counseling. Uh, for the last gosh, it's not about 20 years now, I've also been working with community-based organizations in East Harlem, um, particularly the Harlem Center for Education, 
Um, we work to develop. <laughs> I have a fan. <laughs> we, we work to develop after school programs that we provide to uh, middle schools and elementary schools uh, throughout the East Harlem area. In addition, we provide financial aid support and other student support services uh, throughout the city. Uh, I've also been working for the last 10 years now um, to develop a middle school in East Harlem, which is one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, and so I've been able to apply a lot of the practical things that we're doing in the school of ed to that particular setting in the middle school. As I mentioned, I'm a father, so my first role is husband and father. I uh, an eight-year-old son, and uh, he acts like he's older, but he's 13. <laughs> um, so I'm using my psychology training every day to <laughs> navigate that social world of middle school. Uh, I, I just want to say how thankful I am to be participating today. Um, I did not know much about the McCauley program at all, quite frankly. And last semester, I had the pleasure of co-teaching a course with a colleague of mine who's fantastic, uh, Professor Jenny Tooch, who happens to be here in the back of the room. Uh, and we offered the course to students in the Macaulay program. And it was a wonderful opportunity for us to get to know more about Macaulay, about the students, about their interests. Um, I had a fantastic time, and thankfully I was, I was invited to, to come here. So I just want to thank specifically Jonah Garnick, who's in the back of the room. Thanks so much, Jonah, for giving me a shout-out and getting here. Thank you very much. All right. Next we'll have Michelle Klein. Hi, I'm Michelle Klein. I teach at the Graduate Center at CUNY in Psychology and Urban Ed and Women's Studies. Um, I have taught, uh, before that, I taught at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have taught at Bedford Hill Correctional <laughs> Facility. I'd like to hear some applause. Well, that. <laughs> You're not a part of the family, not me. So that's who I am. Um, for 30 ish years, I've been worrying about the gentrification of education, and, and now it is upon us. Um, and uh, much more dramatic ways than I even worried about 20 years ago when I was framing dropouts. Um, I do a lot of expert testimony, testimony around high stakes testing and educational exclusion. I, um, I'm deeply involved in what's called the Public Science Project at the Graduate Center, which is a, um, a research institute founded by uh, faculty, graduate students, activists, high school kids, high school push-outs, formerly incarcerated folks who are involved in community-based research that's historic, theoretical, and organized toward policy and organizing. If we're doing kids, I got three. I make and attract boys. <laughs> they come to me via foster care and C-section. They <laughs> range from 17 to 35. And I'm really honored to be here. When I grow up, I want to be Shakima. Yeah. I just take it anywhere. Thanks. We'll have Vanessa Anderson. It's almost loud, so let me know if it's too loud, and I can stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my name is Vanessa Anderson, and um, I work um, at for Bard College, which is up in Amadella on Hudson, but um, I'm the director of research and evaluation for the early college program here in New York City. There's um, Bard Early High School um, Manhattan, which is on Louis Five, and Bard Early High School Queens, which um, is in Long Island City. And last year, we opened a campus in Newark, um, which I've been um, really excited um, to kind of jump into. We don't have much data for New York because we have, right now, one year retention rate, but we'll graduate our first um, class of um, seniors slash second year college students. Um, that's June, and I'm super excited about that. Um, prior to that, I had bunches of jobs since I was 14. Probably the most, uh, one of the most interesting ones was um, working in um, CUNY's Office of Policy uh, Research, which I did for um, a few years. Um, and I worked on uh, some of uh, CUNY's initiatives with um, the senior chair initiatives with the DOE as part of um, Graduate NYC. Um, which is awesome. It's always really glad to be, I'm always, it's always really exciting, and I'm always really glad to be excited, to be invited um, to do anything to me again. And like you, um, when I come back, I want to be um, a Macaulay student. <laughs> but I feel like I've met so many fabulous ones that I don't want to limit myself. I'm not a parent, but I have nephews that run me ragged, and um, I too seem to only attract boys, except for my two fake nieces, who also run me ragged. <laughs> but anyone can offer me a fake niece that will allow me to have a party and go to uh, 
to um, the American Girl Club. Club. Oh, that would be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. Next we'll have Esmeralda Simmons. Uh, good morning, everyone. And it's, uh, <laughs> 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 All right, pull that in the back. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll bring it up, bring it Good morning, everyone. Um, I am a CUNY person, so let me start out that way. I, <laughs> hey, it is true. I slight hiatus during law school, but you know I made my way back as soon as possible. I currently serve as the executive director of the Center for Law and Social Justice, a minuscule civil rights, human rights center uh, located at Medrevers uh, College's campus. And we do big things in civil rights in New York City. We recently just redistricted, uh, along with multicultural, multi ethnic, and multiracial coalition, the congressional lines for New York City. Successfully, our plan is now your district. Uh, and we're trying to do the same for the Assembly, the Senate, and New York City Council, which you all know is happening right now. Uh, a little more about me. I came to to Medgarvis to the center, and I am uh, one of the founders of the center because it was my dream job, so you created it. Uh, from, uh, from being the, uh, the first deputy commissioner for human rights for the state of New York. Uh, I served in that position under Mario Cuomo. I don't know how old I am. And, I <laughs> uh, and um, before that, I served in a variety of governmental civil rights uh, legal positions. Um, I graduated in the first class, I hope you'll listen to me, the first class of the Black and Puerto Rican Studies majors from Hunter College. That's because, and the reason I think I'm on this panel, I was one of those students who barricaded, blocked in, took over, sat in, created the Child Care Center, and created that department as one of our demands. But our primary demand was for open admission in CUNY, so we'll be having a discussion about that and how it has evolved, uh, been moved, et cetera. And how McCauley is, and I'm so happy to see the diversity in this room, how being in McCauley reminds me of being in Hunter in 1968. Not because of the diversity. <laughs> but because of the standards to get in. And I am an educational advocate um, as well as a voting rights advocate, so I'm very, very happy to be here to talk to you about creating the CUNY that we uh, want, all want to see. And I also want to uh, take my hat off to Rick Schaefer, my, um, <coughs> the, the general counsel for CUNY, who's done a whole lot of good and has to defend a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, Eric Hoffman. Thank you. Uh, how many of the folks in the room here graduated from New York Public School in the last 10 years? Okay. And did any of you participate in a program called College Now? Okay. So College Now is one of CUNY's collaborative programs. And for the last nine years, I've been, uh, I came to CUNY nine years ago, and I've been working in the College Now program. But broader than that, I'm the director for the universities collaborative programs, which are broad scale programs with the Department of Education, primarily the middle schools and the high schools, and College Now is our largest. We serve about 25,000 uh, New York Public School students every year in these programs. And I'll talk a little bit more about those um, in the breakup session. I have some data on those. But you know, what we're really looking at in those programs is the college transition process. Uh, you know, for many years, and we're still talking about access as a big issue, but now we're also talking about access and success. And we're really trying to make sure that the education and the preparation that students get to go to college um, is also uh, what we receive as the colleges, that we're doing everything that we can to make sure we support them so they're successful. So collaborative programs is the first step for that for many students. Uh, students can take college credit classes in our programs, uh, or they can take pre-college uh, classes that help prepare them for community placement exams, if that's part of it. Uh, and then we have some services for students once they come to the campuses to help support the student advisement on many of our campuses, especially at community colleges, where the advisement ratios um, are sometimes one to 3,000 uh, some of these campuses. So we're really trying to do our best on the front end to make sure that students are better prepared once they uh, come to college. Uh, another issue that uh, I worked on through the transition programs is uh, I, I had probably the most 
important professional development experience of my life. I'm working on a new community college that just opened this past fall. And uh, the input that we had in the university as folks who were working with middle school and high school students uh, seemed unprecedented. I mean, we knew what the pathways were that students were taking, and our voices were actually part of designing that college. So the structures that are put in place would really support the students once they got there. <coughs> so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's a privilege really to sit with this group up here and also to be at Macaulay uh, talking to all of you about these, uh, these issues that are so important to your state. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ed. And thank you for all our time. So this is how it's going to go. Um, I'm going to ask a question um, to one of our panelists, but each panelist is open to answer. And we hope that you're able to ask questions using Twitter and during the Q&A, we'll have another moderator come and handle that because I have class. I have to support my excellence too, you know. <laughs> okay. So my first question goes to Esmeralda. Um, in an article published in the New York Times last summer, it was reported that CUNY's closed admission policy instated 10 years ago requiring higher minimum scores for acceptance set off an ethnic shift in CUNY's composition. How have closed admission policies changed CUNY's student population and how will this change CUNY and New York City in the long run? All right, so uh, I'd like the way that's put closed admission. I really wouldn't call it closed admission. Mm -hmm. I call it limited admission, okay? <laughs> um, to talk about it, we really need to talk about what is called open admission. And I read the same article, and then I read a study that was done by CSS that talked about how CUNY had shifted dramatically. And I'm not the statistical person, though I use statistics in my work, so I'm going to let that part to someone else. But what I will will talk about is already uh, in my alma mater, Hunter, and I saw some people wearing Hunter badges, uh, there has been a dramatic shift. Now, understand me. I already told you, I was there in 1968. Uh, I was one of approximately 50 black and Latino students in the entire student student body. Hunter. Now Hunter is huge now. Hunter is about one third of was about one third of the size then. But that amount was definitely less than one percent of the student body. And we got in the way everybody else got in. Uh, you know, high high scores, SATs, you know, um, um, honor students, you know, extracurricular activity, the whole thing that you do when you're going off to some high ranking school. Um, the shift that occurred from 1970, if you haven't gone and read the official, I read it, you read it. <laughs> if, I, if you haven't gone and read the official CUNY discussion, uh, it's about, uh, let's say, 44 pages of open admission and its history. Do that. It's on the Hugh CUNY uh, historical website. Uh, but understand that there was a dramatic shift between 1970 when the doors were flung wide open due to political pressure, student pressure, and I'm told you already, sit in. I, I hadn't known that part of the college was a flame, but that's the way it was uh, um, uh, portrayed in the report. And political pressure on the uh, electoral realm as well. You know, the, the mayor then, Lindsay, decided this is what he wanted to do. Um, but as CUNY opened its doors up and tried to infuse students who were lesser prepared. There was also a tag that was placed on those students. Most people presume the lesser prepared students were black and Latino. Even though CUNY's records indicated that there were a whole swath of, uh, of white students, Caucasian students, they were also overpaid. Let's be clear, let's be clear. The New York City Public Schools are not really doing a major bang of job for most of the students. So, Anybody that got into a senior college uh, had to have been in a 50% of a 50% of their class, uh, but didn't have to have a certain SAT score. As a matter of fact, they eliminated the SAT requirement. And uh, basically, they were also looking for students coming from a underprivileged, economically underprivileged. This all tied in with financial aid. Let's not be silly. They let the students in that are underprepared and let their money. So what has happened now? What has happened now? 
Cuny has realized that its great open admission experiment uh, has not been the great success it wanted it to be because all of the undergirding that it thought would happen in terms of remediation did not happen to the level that it was necessary. And, I'll let you other. And one other thing that's very, very important. There was never a wholesale buy-in by the faculty and the administration of CUNY schools to the fact that open admissions was a good idea. The only other thing that happened in open admissions that has changed dramatically since we've gone back to quote closed admissions or limited admissions is that is that tuition was imposed, that started limiting it. And now we've gone back, I think we, CUNY has gone back to uh, academic achievement in order to be admitted to senior schools. And even, even a certain level is being hinted at for the community colleges. And that's almost back to exactly where it was when I was in 1968. Thank you very much, Esmeralda. Now, Vanessa, I want you to um, speak to what Esmeralda is discussing from your experience. Um, one of our past mayors, Rudy Giuliani, has been described as declaring a war on CUNY. He criticized it as having low standards, suggesting that the best and brightest were not at this institution. What does CUNY's demographic data from the time of open admissions tell us about the students of CUNY's past? Well, the, you, you, those questions are different. Yeah, so please answer. <laughs> I can't answer the best and right. brightest because okay. demographic data. Right. But I can answer demographic data. Sounds based good. On Department of Education. Okay, right. Um, Department of Education data. Um, from a period just before um, limited admissions, <laughs> and um, up until um, I chose the last graduating class so that I could look at both um, the racial makeup of the entering cohort as well as grad rate. I see. Um, you know, over the course of that cohort, the students who entered in 2005 um, with a six-year graduation rate, with a six-year graduation rate date of 2011. Um, and what you see is overall, um, overall there are some shifts, but the real shift, um, demographic shift, is um, that CUNY's um, Black and Latino population um, dips quite a bit from uh, 1998, um, when Black students made up about 23% of um, CUNY's uh, senior colleges, to <coughs> The entry cohort of 2005 um, when they made up 17 percent. Um, the real shift is or one of the real shifts, and then as well, Latino, Latino students, uh, base, Latino and white students are basically at the same level. Um, Asian students um, rise from making up about 16 percent of the population to 22 percent, and a lot of that is due to demographic shifts in the city. Um, but when you look at individual colleges, is where you start to see. Um, major shifts. I see. Tell me more. Do <laughs> 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 tell. I have large numbers in my head, so I'm going okay. to my little All right, please. Yeah. Um, so you <laughs> see that um, Baruch, Baruch goes from having um, a flat population of roughly 15% for that graduating cohort of um, 2002, which would have been an entering cohort in 1996, a cohort that entered in 1996, to um, an entering first-time full-time freshman cohort percentage of 9% in um, 2005, meaning exactly with an expected graduation date of 2011. Um, we see the same, um, the same shift, or not quite as bad, um, with Brooklyn College, where black students made up 25% of the population, sorry, 23% of the population um, in 1996, that full-time freshman cohort expected to graduate in 2002, to 18% in, um, um, in 2005 with that expected graduation date of 2011. Um, and, and similarly, um, what, well, what's actually really interesting too is that City College goes from being roughly 5% white um, that uh, is for that, that class of 2002, um, entering 1996, to being 13% um, white in 2011. Wow. So the overall shifts are not as dramatic as the shifts within particular schools. I see. I see. 
Thank you very much. My next question is for Michelle. Michelle, what challenges are facing professors and administrators who are trying to provide a first-rate education to the changing population of students at CUNY? Mm. <laughs> I don't actually think we're the ones who are suffering. Um, so I want to shift the question a little. Right, I spent a lot of time with W.E.B. Du Bois, and uh, in 1899, he was hired by Susan Wharton of the Wharton School of University in Pennsylvania, aforementioned some long before. Um, and she invited W.E.B. Du Bois in to uh, help her understand the Negro problem in Philadelphia, why they were so like criminal and uneducated and couldn't take care of the kids. And, so sick and had so much TV, and he knew, he, and he knew, and they kept doing that, right? And um, he knew he was being hired for a racist project, and what he decided to do was to flip the script and say, what's up with the history, the economics, the racial stratification, the structures, and the systematic forms of exclusion that produce a set of conditions that look as though they fit inside the population. And so with W.E.B. Du Bois as my guide on so much, I want to flip the script a bit. And I had the privilege of sitting at 80th Street um, with the chancellor and others talking about really um, building public education in the country of Haiti. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's really a stunning commitment to hear Chancellor Goldstein speak about using our resources and the kind of soul and chutzpah of CUNY to say a country needs to be educated. Um, there are more Haitian doctors in Montreal than in Haiti. So I want to take that commitment and move it back home and think through what are the structural conditions that keep us in a context that is producing the kinds of data that Vanessa talked to us about. And those drops and percentages are interesting, but when you think if you reframe the drops in percentages as percent loss, much of what you were saying was a quarter and 30% loss of black and Latino kids on the four-year um, college campuses. And I would say, um, I want to say three quick things. Can I do that? Yeah. One is the CSS report is a really important report, and I recommend that you all read it. And um, David Jones, um, simply commissioned a study that would ask the question, to what extent does CUNY continue to serve all of the children of the city of New York? And they concluded not that we should return to open admissions, although many of us might be interested in that opportunity. Not <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, but what they did was track the ways in which austerity has gotten appropriated as an opportunity for some of our four-year colleges to kick up their SAT entrance um, scores, such that private school kids are now going to SUNY, SUNY kids are going to four-year CUNYs, four-year CUNY black and brown going to community college. That's a structural issue that we can all um, challenge. And it's particularly, my second point, ironic, that something like a third of the top elite colleges are no longer relying on SATs as their admission strategy. So that's really important for us to start. Having taught at the mountaintop, right? I taught mm -hmm. at them. I know how young people get in there. I know how rich kids get untimed SAT test scores. I know how legacies get through. And there's a way in which those systems that look honorable, filled with honor, are also filled with a whole bunch of loopholes. And what we're watching is a country walk away from high stakes tests for elite kids, even as we hyperimpose them for poor and working class kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having said that, I love CUNY. I left him to be a CUNY. My, the doctoral program that I am a part of has an admissions process that's extremely rigorous. And what we look at is your passion and desire and capacity to do research. Your willingness to take on big ideas, the extent to which faculty have found you to be an independent thinker and a community player. And then we look at your transcripts. And then we might take a peek at your GREs. But if we did the GREs first, our program would not be the gorgeous, flourishing 56% 
students of color doctoral program that our PhD program in psychology is. And I'm happy to give you the data that our students get jobs at Michigan and Delaware and Georgia. But, but one needs to think about admissions in a very, in a wide scope. You know that there's a legal challenge, sorry, um, Brooklyn Tech, but there's a legal challenge to the selective high schools in New York City. Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, we're doing that because, because that's what that represents the children of the city of New York. It represents disproportionately kids who went to private school for middle school and very, very elite white and Asian for the most part kids. And I'm just, it's my last point, I'm very happy that the, um, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund joined that lawsuit mm -hmm. because there are plenty of Asian groups who have gotten excluded because of the fetishistic commitment to a single TED score. My last sentence is, I don't know why CUNY has not engaged the Community Service Society report and insisted that we just have a conversation about this. Um, I have been hurt to hear that CUNY has gone out of its way for that report not to circulate. It seems to me what CUNY stands for is the courage to dare to have hard conversations <coughs> the rest of the country has walked away from. That's what I love about CUNY. I just wanted to follow up because in listening to Michelle talk, it really touched me personally. Um, what I didn't mention in my introduction is that I'm a CUNY graduate. <laughs> I, I got my doctorate degree from the CUNY Graduate Center. I was always one of those kids who was not a good test taker. Uh, I, I got my undergraduate degree from Cornell, uh, but I required remediation. And so I went to a program called the COSEP program that provided support for me before I even started my freshman year. Um, when I graduated from Cornell, I had pretty poor GRE scores. But because of the time and the commitment of the people in the admissions process at CUNY Graduate Center, they took the time to see beyond those scores. And now I'm a chair of a department. Mm -hmm. uh, and I struggle with faculty all the time around the rigid admissions requirements that we have for our programs that might have blocked me from being in the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that really concerns me, when we, as, as Michelle mentioned, and if you look at some of the work by fairtest.org, fair there's a lot of mm -hmm. information about mm -hmm. just the numbers of schools that have really moved away. Schools, yeah. Bowdoin College, Middlebury, Wake Forest University. Yeah. You know, major schools that have walked away from the use of the, of the SATs um, because the bigger question is about predictive validity. What are these test scores actually telling us? What kind of judgments can we make about these scores? Um, it takes a lot of time to do a different approach, which is the thorough review of candidates and really looking at them in a holistic way to make some guesstimates about what we will. Because again, we're really just making some loose judgments. Um, thankfully, I benefited from not having the rigid um, and so I'm here to be able to, to be able to talk about that. But I do very much worry about that. Uh, and I do know that as a chair of a department, when we try to move away from looking strictly at GPA scores, it takes a lot more faculty time to review essays, to interview candidates, to talk with them, to get to understand their story, right, to get a better sense of their commitment to the program. Because just because we've got lots of students with high scores who don't fare very well in our programs, right, for a number of different reasons. Um, so again, the issue of commitment, we really do have to think about the faculty resources, the time, the commitment, the will to put in that kind of energy to make better judgments about it. So just while we're on you, um, and <laughs> we're on you, <laughs> in the spotlight, everyone. <laughs> you have the microphone. Um, from your opinion and from your expertise in, in considering, considering you know, alternative academic approaches, um, what are the ways you think the CUNY can encourage supportive learning communities with students? Um, how, can they, how can the institution prepare um, students to be academically and professionally competitive while they're at CUNY and once they complete their education? I think that there, there, there are a couple of different parts. I mean, the first part I'll, I'll take is, is the idea of the learning communities. And I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges that we often have, I'll speak from a faculty perspective, is we need to understand our students better. Um, in my year of research is in cultural response to teaching. And I spend a lot of time trying to understand the bigger questions. What does this degree mean to you? What, what are you interested in? Why are you here? What are your long-term goals? Tell me about your family. You know, what role does this play in your family's life, your experiences here at college? And then more importantly, what do you need? Um, and I think that there are a number of different levels. We, and, and within our school of Hunter College, and particularly our, our, our programs in, in, in the School of Education, we have small programs where we have better opportunities to have advisement for students and provide smaller networks for students that support professional goals in terms of job placement and that nature. Uh, but we could do a much better job of that 
bringing students together to better to understand what their stories are, what their needs are. Uh, I think that sometimes faculty do this above and beyond their roles, um, but we see how, how much it pays dividends. I try to connect with my students in multiple ways. When I teach my courses, I will always ask them, what do you want to get out of this course? Tell me things that you want to learn that are not part, particularly on a syllabus, but let's just talk more about what you, what, what you expect out of this course. Uh, I do think infrastructurally, um, we have to think more about how students are living their lives and ways in which we might modify course delivery to address some of those things. I uh, had a nice conversation last night about people talking about online courses um, and talking about sometimes the pitfalls of online courses. Um, and just because we can doesn't mean that we should. And so we have to think about how students experience education, the different ways in which they learn. What are the best ways to support that learning? A one-size-fits-all model doesn't work. As my colleague said, it doesn't work in fashion, and it doesn't work in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> Great. I'd like to hear from Eric about um, his um, experiences in the strategic planning of the new community college, and specifically with um, focusing on the institution as a way for current students to work with like-minded faculty and administrators in demanding a refocus on CUNY's promise for an accessible and free education for all. And also because he did college now, and he's the reason why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Your college now in, in its um, kind of context of the conversation that we're having here. So when CUNY decided to end remediation at the senior colleges, and this is this language that we use about closed admissions, and we're talking about what's happening at the senior colleges, um, one of their responses was to take this program that was uh, that started at Kingsborough Community College in the, in the 80s, really working with about four large comprehensive high schools in Brooklyn, and it's expanded a bit on, on Staten Island. So we're going to take this program called College Now and expand it university-wide. And this is a, a way of saying that we're going to provide the opportunity so if every public high school student has a chance to, to engage with CUNY before he or she graduates, and we can create that pathway to college. Now, I think that the decision was, uh, I wasn't here, but I would go out on a limb and say it was a political decision. I don't think that there was a lot of thought about what it actually means to engage uh, across the university system with the schools. And as we look at what's happening in the schools over the past 10 years uh, in the Bloomberg administration, it has become even harder to engage when we've gone from you know, maybe a couple hundred high schools and then the small schools have been where you now have 550 high schools in the city. And so I, I speak from a programs perspective. I'm a programs person. We're trying to engage. We're trying to create partnerships between colleges and, and the schools. We're trying not to point fingers and say, oh, well, if the DOE just did a better job. Well, this plan at CUNY has to do as well. But one statistic that I'll give you about our programs to think about um, the shift in test scores and um, the, the requirements now for students to get into the top tier schools at CUNY, 90% um, of college now uh, participants who graduate go to college. And that is well above the average for the New York City public schools. Um, an entering cohort, so it's about 60% of an entering freshman cohort will graduate and go to college. Um, of, of those who graduate, I should say, go to college. We have 90% of our college now participants going to college. A little over 50% um, of college now students who graduate high school come to CUNY. But over the years, the majority of students were going to our senior colleges. And just in the last two years, we've seen this shift where now the majority of students who have college now experience uh, start at our community colleges. Right. Um, so that's, that's significant. And the thing I would point to is that um, almost without question, it's about students' math <coughs> ability. Yeah. Um, so that shift has been really dramatic. And we see it in our program. These are college-ready students. Yeah. Um, but because of their math, um, the lack of math skills, there's a lot in, in, in policy and educational policy that I think uh, relates to that, they start in the community colleges, and many of them will be successful in the community colleges and transfer. And I think that CUNY's answer to the CSS report was that um, CUNY is a transfer system. And so if you look at the demographics at our senior colleges, right. looking at the whole population, you'll see that it is probably one of the most diverse systems. And it is the most diverse system in the country. Um, but here's this idea of a new community college. So what we saw with our students 
students is we were preparing them. We, we knew that they were having the opportunity to take college credit classes. They were successful in those classes, and they were matriculating in, in high numbers at our colleges. And they were doing a little bit better on the retention and the graduation. And we just thought, well, what are the, what are the roadblocks for them once they get to the colleges? What are the structures and the obstacles that are in place? One thing that we looked at was the transfer of the credit that they, um, the credit they earned if they were in our program. There was a memo that a former executive vice chancellor had written that said any college now class will transfer to any any institution. Well, that looks good on paper, but it actually doesn't happen that way, <laughs> even in CUNY. So that's what this Pathways Project is about, and I know you might have some questions about that. But we started looking at the student's experience. We looked at data. We look at data a lot in our program. So we, we wanted to create a college that had a program approach to the way that it uh, served its students. <coughs> Um, and we invited student voices into that planning um, process along with faculty. There was a lot of resistance from faculty across the university um, because we were, we were tra trying to change the way that um, the system uh, interacted uh, with the students. I think there was a lot of tension in uh, creating the majors the way we did. We actually didn't, uh, we, we took non-credit remedial courses out of the curriculum. We said, well, what we really need to be doing, and I should have gone back to say that my background is in teaching writing, and I did a lot of professional development. Um, I worked with a lot of college faculty before I came to New York. And I think that these issues, and it's something that Jeff was saying, is that we've got to really focus on the teaching and learning endeavor that's happening in our, in our colleges. Um, for me, that means helping all faculty across the disciplines learn how to infuse and build students' literacy skills within their disciplines. I taught writing. I was a literature uh, major. Um, do my grad work in literature. Most of my colleagues who teach writing at campuses have literature backgrounds. Most of the courses that students are taking on campuses are not literature courses. <laughs> and you have to write and read differently in those courses. So looking at students, interviewing students, having students be part of the planning committee for that, and looking at the experiences that we saw of students coming through the New York Public Schools and into CUNY um, was a way that we tried to shape the structures to make the place and the institution um, one that was there to um, help students be as successful as they could without coming up against a lot of these roadblocks. I see, I see. Thank you. Um, now that we're talking about pathways, I'd like to get some of your opinions on the initiative. Um, let's start with Michelle. Michelle, what is your opinion of the proposed pathways initiative, and how do you think it'll affect students in CUNY in general? Um, the microphone. Yeah. For our live stream at home. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, the commitment to pathways is a noble commitment, that is to figure out structural ways that students can move more like an easy path lane from community colleges to the four-year colleges. There has been enormous, enormous faculty, student, and administrator resistance to the ways in which pathways is getting implemented because on the ground, the educators who most understand the way it's going to play out argue that it's going to undermine, standardize, and actually narrow students' educational opportunities and not expand them. So this is another one of those places where the commitment makes really good sense. Graduation rates at community colleges are historically very low, right? And I actually don't lay a lot of that um, blame on, at all on the faculty at community colleges. Faculty at community colleges at CUNY teach nine courses. Mm -hmm. I teach two, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to teach one, basically, right? And I'm teaching doctoral students, and they're teaching a gorgeous salad bar of various skills, biographies, histories, needs, and, and struggles, right, with people who are living at the edge of what the uh, Occupy movement has called precarity, right? Living at the edge of the beach in Brooklyn, <laughs> metaphorically and actually, right? And um, so I have enormous, enormous respect for community college faculty. Those faculty, the faculty of Queensboro, the English faculty, um, have argued that at the level of what Pathways is going to accomplish on those campuses, neither students nor faculty, will be helped, and in fact, our commitment to a broad-based, thick education that includes labs, for instance, 
that includes varieties of ways of teaching literature so that there is African American and um, Hispanic studies, that that will all get tailored down and that it has unfortunately become a kind of neoliberal project. I don't know that that was its intent. I always think CUNY can do better, right? I think we can take hard issues like, what do you do with highly test-driven high school graduates who haven't written in a long time, who sometimes haven't had a real math teacher in a long time, who have been in these test factories with more police than educated, educate, than um, long-term educated. So I'm not unsympathetic to this question. Um, but I have really unrealistic high expectations, like the wine class, mm -hmm. that CUNY should be able to think about this transfer question with the integrity and the knowledge that educators and students bring. And unfortunately, the reason that thousands of faculty and students have protested passively, that chairs of departments have sacrificed, taken incredible risks to challenge this, is because at the level of implementation, it is not going to help either the students or the faculty. I see. Would anyone else like to speak before we ask our final question? Okay. Okay, please. Yeah. I, I just really wanted to just agree with, with all the points that Michelle had said. Um, I think one of the things that I, when I was first confronted with this as the department chair, I heard about this initiative before my faculty and my department did. And so my first question was, well, what problem is this trying to solve? Mm -hmm. And then the second is now, what's the consequence of this implementation? And so in looking at the ways in which the problem was framed, it seemed to me, though, that the, that the solution was trying to address what was potentially a, a smaller problem in a very, very broad way. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we start to kind of get down to the nitty gritty of well, who was really having difficulty, well, CUNY already had systems in place to try to address some of these things, like the TIPS program, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I know for a fact within the School of Education, we've worked with some of our community college partners to try to work out articulation agreements between them and our programs. Um, and so we had done lots of work in that area. Uh, and so again, it seemed as though this was a very large reactionary move that had very, very broad implications that impacted upon what we thought of as what it means to be educated in a diverse city like New York, mm -hmm. right, ultimately, right? And so faculty came together to create things like our general education requirements, which we included things like foreign language, God forbid. Yay. And so now what we end up seeing is that with something like Pathways, it does tend to limit, mm -hmm. and things that were required now become options, mm -hmm. and then ultimately what it does is it pits departments against each other when everyone is in agreement that everything should be in there. And so now we have these hard, forced choices that ultimately impact upon what we see as our imprint. Right, I mean, we are a university, but we are individual colleges. Um, and at the individual college level, one of the things we always think about is, how do we recognize, in my case, how do I see my, what's, what's my 100 students look like? Right? Everybody's going to have similar kind of, well, what makes this person stand out? Right? And really, this idea of the general education requirement was our way of thinking about our perspective on what it means to be educated in a diversity like New York. Um, and having that curtailed has clearly caused some frustration for faculty. Uh, and, and I do think that the problems will continue. Uh, unfortunately. Well, though, well, well needed. Thank you. That's a great lead into our final question. And I'd like to hear from each and every single one of you because your perspective has been very useful for framing our discussion today. And the question is um, Is CUNY fulfilling its promise of a first rate education for all? How so, and how can it improve? I know it's a big question, but we love asking big questions here. <laughs> Well, you, you've heard some of the numbers and you've heard um, many opinions um, based on facts. However, I think it is pretty clear that right now, uh, looking at the population uh, of students, college-ready students and college students, that CUNY is, has not yet fulfilled its promise. But understand, a promise is a promise. It is, it is a goal. The real question is never has it fulfilled, because it's never fulfilled. The real question is what is CUNY doing to move toward fulfilling that promise? Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're here discussing excellence and at the same time discussing access is a, is a wonderful start to re-energize the question of 
CUNY's mission. And I have spoken to folks who are at CUNY way before I was. Um, and they talk about the CUNY was meant to serve the working class and the people of the city, the students of the city who otherwise would not be able to go to college. Not those students who were so well prepared, so, so, so privileged that they could have gone to any college anywhere. Um, so I am, I am very concerned about the economics of the students going to CUNY. Many, many, many CUNY students are at the edge. Many have homelessness issues, health issues, child care issues. I raise my hand, I don't want to go. Uh, uh, with the child care issues. And understand that CUNY needs to offer academic excellence. And that leads right into the pathway question. I was appalled when I thought that there was going to be a science class. I mean, not happy at science, I'm a science class. <laughs> but, but, you know, math, I, I, I am not faculty, so I will let faculty lead on this issue, but I was upset, and I, obviously I signed the petition, um, because I'm at CUNY and I care about CUNY. But this is our CUNY. All of you will ultimately graduate. The question is, are you going to move on, or are you going to stay in the trenches? to help CUNY be what it needs to be. We also need to understand that we need to have more uh, college now. We need to have a hundred more. You know, SEEK doesn't need to be downsized, it needs to be upside. All the programs that were working, that we, have, that we have proof that they worked, need to be invested in, not tossed away and said we have a, a formula. And then finally I want to answer another question that you asked before. What is the best way to make sure that our students, all CUNY students, and particularly speaking to Macaulay students now, come away ready to face the world, ready to use the talent and your extraordinary academic gifts. And I say to you that your challenge is you must find something bigger than yourself that you are willing to work for, that you're willing to give for, that may not necessarily lead to a job or a whatever, you know. And work on that as you simultaneously work on the other things. In working on both simultaneously, you will develop your leadership and you will develop the skills that will allow you to, to, to succeed not only in your career, but also in your passion for social justice. <laughs> I think that the first um, uh, the first group of people I would go to to answer the question about the billion promise is the students, right? What do students think about the education that they're getting at CUNY? And you know, it's the, the whole range of students from the community colleges and certificate programs to graduate students, the students that we call in here. And you have to ask the students what is their experience in the college and, and what what do they think they can do because of that education and what potential do they have because of that education. Um, I was also going to add, uh, you know, you said it's not just about the job, but I would also look to employers of CUNY students. You know, I think that higher ed has to work more closely uh, with um, employers just to think about you know, what makes it relevant for students when they're in the classroom and how do faculty do more experiential learning classrooms? How do you incentivize that for faculty so the experiences aren't just what was the traditional um, sit in your seat and give lecture to and learn from the book? Um, so, you know, you can talk about CUNY as a whole and as a system and its broad reach. You can narrow it down to an institution and what does an individual institution do, and then you can look at the individual student. Okay, what is his or her experience uh, of the education, and do they feel that their opportunities um, have, and their possibilities have been expanded because of that experience? Thank you. So I always feel like, no, I'm going to feel like that person, that kid in class who's like just piggybacking on other people's <laughs> um, responses. But um, I'm going to start with the fact that until, so no institution has fulfilled its mission until, or its promise until 100% of its students are 
getting what they came to get out of their education. So meaning both meaning the diploma, <laughs> the um, sort of job and career skills, the friendships and camaraderie, and everything else that we're that we're supposed to be getting out of um, our college experiences. So much like Esmeralda said, it's we can't necessarily measure that from you know someone from a 40% graduation rate to a 50 percent graduation rate, but what we can measure is progress. And I think that's where that's I think what CUNY does do um, and why I'm really proud to always to be to be to have been affiliated and to forever be affiliated um, with CUNY because Michelle says that I I guess I'll always be in her uh, <laughs> I guess I'll always audit her, uh, her class and her class and um, in the fact that CUNY is an institution that re examines itself and one where all stakeholders do hold the university and the city and the state accountable for providing what they feel entitled to. Um, and so it will be it will be a very long <laughs> process to that hundred percent satisfaction and hundred percent success outcome. Um, right, but what I do love about Kenny is that we are working on it, and you think we do need to um, expand our relationships with employers and with um, the New York City um, Department of Education um, and all of the other people who actually do have a stake in Kenny being the place that the community that we want it to be. The community we deserve. <laughs> um, so as I said earlier, I had the privilege of teaching at Bedford Hills. Um, correctional facility, which is the maximum security facility for women in New York State. And um, and I met many, many brilliant women who were probably um, considered educationally disposable when they were younger, and they got college degrees while they were at Bedford, and then they come out and they get master's degrees at Hunter and social work, and they're at John Jay, and fortunately for all of us, they're all over the place. Um, educating, giving back, growing families, bringing up the next generation. They are the only group that I know who loves to pay taxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've been spoiled, unlike most of you, because I've seen capacity. And I feel like I've had 30 years of you know, interviewing high school dropouts and saying, damn, another smart one. No one's going to believe me. It's a good thing I taped it when I was at Penn. You know, that's what I did, and I thought the secretary will at least believe me, another really smart kid. And I would say, were you the kind of kid who participated a lot in school? She'd say, oh, no, not me. I was a good kid. <laughs> and I thought, wow, therein lies the question, right? That is not what I meant. Um, so I feel like I've gotten to see brilliance everywhere I go. At Penn as well. Um, but there it was kind of brilliance with a lot of scaffolding. Right, kids who at age two and three and four had parents who knew they were going to pay. They already had the car with the bumper stick with the whatever on the back of the window. So, so what I've met in prison, what I've met at CUNY, are people who, despite the odds, decided I'm going to do something amazing. I'm going to get educated and I'm going to give back. Right, that is the spirit of CUNY. So, has CUNY done enough? Never. Is CUNY the most magnificent institution in the country? Absolutely. Does CUNY have some work to do? No doubt. Um, what CUNY is great at is having a bold vision and fighting back, right? It is not yet the spring, but people will be back on the Three years ago, a bunch of faculty and students went up to Albany to fight about the, to argue for public employees, right? From public employees' pensions and insurance and um, funding for public institutions on the line, and some of us agreed to get arrested. And these poor cops who were putting handcuffs on old arms, <laughs> one of them whispered to me, thanks for doing this for us, because we can't do it for ourselves. Yeah. That's what CUNY is, right? CUNY, we don't shut doors behind us. Right? CUNY is the best version of each of our ethnic groups that knows when you make it, you keep the door open. And all of us are from ethnic groups where there are large numbers of people who said, I made a thing because you shut the door, it's a little drafty. <laughs> right? Whether it's my, my tribe, Jews, African Americans, Latinos, right? The Asia, we're all, we've all got like relatives, so we're like, why are you still fighting for that stuff? Right. We're in, right? So, um, has CUNY done enough? Absolutely not. Um, we've got work to do. I have a challenge for Macaulay and for CUNY. Um, I would like to see us really take up this admissions question. 
Um, in Texas, people, uh, they've got the, you know, top 10% of every high school. It's a flawed system, but it's an interesting system uh, that relies on the fact that public high schools are segregated, right? Um, and so they take the top 10% and they diversify the uh, University of Texas at Austin. We could do such a, such a project here. Or we could turn to, there's a set of schools in New York, the performance assessment Consor the Performance Standards of course, uh, Consortium, 32 schools, I think, that have fought the good fight around high-stakes tests. The students take the English and the um, uh, Regents, but they also have a portfolio assessment, and they have gorgeous graduation rates, college-going rates. Students aren't in remediation. When you go to their final project presentation, there's another student, a teacher, a parent, and a university person to whom they defend their history paper, their English papers. They're beautiful schools of everyday kids. They are not getting into teams. They are not, for the most part, getting into Macaulay. They should be. My challenge, take some of them. I will get the money to do the study, and I will keep it entirely transparent. transparent. And I'll put Rick Shaker on the <laughs> 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 And David Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring wine. <laughs> you bring the wine. This is how these kids do. This is a critical moment. In a family that loves each other, we have been confronted with some data that says we have to stop and rethink. My challenge is CUNY at large, but Macaulay in particular, a beautiful, beautiful, precious moment in our in our system that we take this up, and I promise, I will get the research money and we will do an entirely transparent analysis. We could throw in the, kids, the College Now kids, <laughs> and let's actually look at, can we create a system where excellence and equity are redundant rather than pitted against each other? Mm -hmm. Thank you. As the last person on the chain, I was trying to think of a sophisticated way to say ditto. I agree with everything that was, was said. Um, just, just, to, just to add one other level of it, I do think a lot about students as agents of change. Uh, and, and, I, and I really think about the institution of community, not just as a university, but as an institution of change for the city of New York. Um, and I was listening a lot about this notion of college readiness. And I do think that a lot of what we're talking about needs to be trickled down to our K through 12 educational system. Uh, and I think that there's a disconnect. Um, on one hand, we have a focus on high school proficiency. On the other hand, there's a focus on college readiness. And the disconnect between those two things has caused lots of problems. Right? And, so, and, and I, so I do think that when we are thinking about what it means to be college ready, that's a conversation that has to go back to inform K through 12 education. Uh, I think for Macaulay students, thinking about the experiences that you've had in high school that got you here, and using those experiences and that information to inform the next generation, to inform teachers about how best to support student learning. Those are things I think are critically important, and oftentimes what happens is people get through something, <coughs> get through a challenge, they get some sort of level of success, and they move on to the next thing. Uh, and then we tend, people then have to have to deal with the same kinds of challenges over again the following generation. So, so I do think that we do need to take these experiences and use them as an opportunity to try to inform the dialogue um, and really focusing on early grade, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. What do we need to do to start to get kids to think about the fact that college is a possibility for them? Mm -hmm. I mean, I spend lots of time working with elementary mm -hmm. school kids, mm -hmm. and even at very early ages, because of the system that we have in place, they start to self-identify with the kinds of assessment systems that are in place. So they'll say things like, I'm a level two. Right. I'm a level right. two. I'm a two. And it becomes the self fulfilling prophecy that impacts upon the levels of self efficacy. It becomes the lens by which they judge everything else as they go through the educational system. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to counteract because they start to use it as generalized ways of thinking about themselves. Uh -huh. uh, and so the more we can continue to talk about those possibilities, uh, elementary schools bring kids to college campus. Let them see what it's all about. Right? Let, them, yeah, let them understand that it's an important thing. I remember just as a side story when I was working with a, with a non profit agency in, in East Harlem. One of the things that we tried to do was not just to talk about college, but to kind of be about college and bring kids to college campuses. And so we got some funding to bring a small group of students um, from middle school. I started in middle school. They took them to Princeton University. Um, and we were walking along the Princeton campus, and occasionally I'd hear some claps and walk a little bit longer, and then I heard some claps again. So I stopped and looked at the students, and I said, you guys clap? 
clapping for? And they said, oh, we clap when we see black people. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, I have to go to class. We're reading the table this week, so that's going to be fun. And the wonderful Shakuna doctor will be doing the Q&A session, so please, give it a round of applause. Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm excited to hear all of your questions. And you can also tweet us your questions, hashtag supporting excellence, no spaces. And just to let all of you know, if you see any of the supporting excellence staff on our phones, we're either live tweeting, we're trying to be Twitter friendly, or um, communicating with each other, just a heads up. Um, so does anyone want to start off with the questions? Yes, in the back. Good evening, everyone. Dallas Lee Bell, CUNY Black Walking, talking commercial for the National Urban League and the New York Urban League and the other United States. My question, what are we going to do at the middle school level to turn around something I learned was push out mm -hmm. and drop out? We have middle schools where people are pushed out and they drop out. And what are we doing to engage our males of color from elementary school to make sure they make it into middle school and through that middle passage to high school and then on to our CUNY two-year and four-year and graduate campus.
Cornwell Individual School are preparing their students for college. Uh, so that's one focus. The other thing I would say is that in college now, we have a real struggle at engaging minority males uh, to participate in these programs. We probably have, you know, at best, a 60-40 split, just female-male, without disaggregating by race and ethnicity. Um, but it's a lot worse, and as they worse, the gap is much wider uh, in some um, schools and in some college programs. And it's not that these young men aren't there, and it's not that they're not qualified. They're just not participating in our program. So we're actually doing research in our programs right now to figure out how do we engage those students. And I would love to hear from um, the college students at some point mm -hmm. to think about how do college students help in recruitment and going out to their schools where they graduated or where they, they're doing work in the communities to engage that population. And I just also want to add a, a, another layer to addressing this the issue around middle school is thinking about the ways in which we teach our children in middle school and the ways in which we engage them with the curriculum. Um, because one of the one of the other issues Dallas is in, in thinking about not just the middle school experience, but of course how that rolls into the high school experience and students' connections to the curriculum and their engagement in class and how then then thereby might decrease the probability that they might, that they might be eligible to go to certain colleges of their choice. Um, I've been involved for the last two years now with a grant from the New York State Education Department. Uh, where I'm working with teachers in some middle schools in East Harlem to help them to develop culturally responsive pedagogy. pedagogy. Uh, and, and so the idea here is for them to really become critical thinkers around the, the curriculum, to think about ways in which it can be modified to address the fact that we have a diverse population of students in the classroom, to think about how we can engage parents in that process, and most importantly, to help them to understand that the students who are coming into their classrooms, who most often are from cultural and ethnic backgrounds different from their own, they come into the classroom with funds and funds of knowledge, for example, right? Sources of information that are important to the learning process. Uh, and so helping to maintain that level of engagement is a critical piece. Uh, and so I do think that that's one of the major challenges that we have, is that oftentimes teachers are not really drawing on the strengths of their students, and particularly males of color. Uh, and so kids start to feel as though they're just separate from this whole institution, right? And they lose a certain level of just motivation, right? And then ultimately, Kind of carries himself all the way through the middle school. Oh, does anyone else? Yes. Oh, <laughs> in the front right there. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, interesting discussion about admission to different programs and the way in which CUNY responds, the way in which the DOE responds. There's sort of an elephant in the room, which is the high stakes testing. Every single thing that's been discussed <clears throat> this morning relates back to kids' as test scores. And you're talking about kids identifying themselves as ones and twos. And that is pervasive to the system. Mm -hmm. The progress reports that, that give the schools a report card, it is almost entirely at the elementary and middle school level, 85% of it is based on test scores. We haven't even examined the CUNY assessment to, uh, test for math. But I know, you know what people alluded to the fact of early college now about the fact that the kids' math scores are very weak. The CUNY test is almost entirely a procedural test. If any school is, is bold enough to try to, to teach in a more creative way, then the kids are going to get killed on the CUNY assessment. So I want to know from, you know, it seems to me that as long as we have the DOE using, and it's not only the DOE, of course, it's, it's nationwide, and mm -hmm. we haven't been helped by Race to the Path, and we haven't been helped, unfortunately, by the Department of Education in Washington. But if we don't take that on, if we don't start to grapple with the problem of assessment that is not test-driven and data-driven that is dependent on the test, I don't think any of these discussions are going to go anywhere. So I want to ask the panel and perhaps the audience, what is it that we all can do to get the CUNY administration and faculty and individuals to join forces with organizations like FairTest? to begin to change the conversation that it is not excellence, it's not about a test score. Excellence is about getting kids to be able to experience. I want for our kids in the public school system the same things that Sasha and Maria have at Sidwell mm -hmm. Bank. And that is not based on test scores. So I would like to know how we can, together, try to figure out a campaign to stop using these test scores as the basis of judgment about children. I'd like to follow up on that as well because I'm a college advisor at one of the schools Michelle described, one of the portfolio schools. 
and my students actually two have applied to Macaulay for the first time. And my students' test scores are weak, and some of them can't get in college now because they don't have the 50 on the Regents, and our school doesn't even take the Regents except for English. And so it's like this revolving circle. And they're not getting into SUNYs and four-year SUNYs, but they're getting in private schools that don't play the test scores. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with all this. And we've been confronting this for a long time in my program. Uh, we have people applying to a my program. This is a very high powered program, SUNY Baccalaureate. And um, <laughs> Like we do the things 
that other people have stopped doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, Nike doesn't want to buy the graduate center, thank God. Right. So it's not the Nike graduate So we're kind of slow to take up the ed reform stuff, but then we take it up when other people are tossing it, like, mm-hmm. like it's used. Um, so this is a moment really for CUNY educate and pack races in some ways an embodiment of these dynamics. Mm-hmm. And we need to connect a whole set of struggles around CUNY against the gentrification of public education. I just, I just want to make one data point because I know we're looking at the data on this. And it's sort of wrapped up in all of these things that you're talking about at CUNY where there are many uh, schools of education on the campuses. Enrollment in graduate schools of education has dropped precipitously in the last few years, and you think, I mean, there are lots of reasons for that, and one of them is the public discourse around teachers and teaching, and the, um, the grading of teachers, and putting pictures of teachers on the front page of Daily News or the Post. Uh, that, it, it's shifting the way that people even think about teaching and wanting to go into education. So I think that there is this, um, this storm and, of all of these things, and it's really t- uh, teacher education is taking a huge hit in this. Mm-hmm. Can I say one more sentence? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> CUNY actually did a report in 2011. I don't know how widespread it is, but there's a report on, you know, what are the uh, criteria for success for at-risk, which, mm-hmm. whatever, mm-hmm. we can fight about that or not, but uh, for at-risk students. And in their own report, they demonstrate that region scores do not predict mm-hmm. GPA, um, do not predict um, persistence or graduation in six years, high school GPA, right? And that is, is the strongest position. <laughs> Last marriage standard. Thank you. So could you tell me that it is fine? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's astonishing. You, you want to talk about data-driven decision-making, evidence-based practice? GPA and good writing really makes a difference if you're going to persist in college. When we Laurie Chaget tracked the kids from the consortium schools um, into college. There were three big findings. One is college teaching wasn't as good as your high school teaching Mm -hmm. at the consortium school. The second was that kids at consortium schools who do these performance assessments, they know how to use adults when they hit a bump in the road. Mm -hmm. They know to trust adults. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids coming out of high state schools they hit a bump in the road and they say, I gotta go, my mom has cancer, my brother's in jail. And you know, I'm out of college, I'm a two anyway, I'm a grandkids, whatever, but I'm really a two. Um, and the the third thing is that, that they they know how to write and they know how to revise. The gift of revision is being lost. It's like a twentieth century idea, right? That you like get a paper back and you revise it. If it's a test score that you get six months later. I simply emphasize that uh, we were talking about big issues before and sink your teeth into something. Uh, this is an education issue, it's an access issue, it's a civil rights issue, it's an immigration issue. The high state test and the results of that in our society and our future is an issue that's cutting across all spheres, all interest groups. My son has been involved in high tech, opposing high tech tests forever, and as I said before, we are one of the three civil rights groups that are challenging as a prototype a high school specialized exam. Mm-hmm. Um, New York State High School. Now, folks, now is the time. And we must move on this regarding as a public policy issue. The money is driving this. The only way to change the direction of the money that is coming from DC through Albany, is to get on a public policy uh, approach, a public policy panel, a public policy movement, and change what is happening in the source of the power around high tech. It did fall out of the sky, folks. Somebody was lobbying. Mm-hmm. And that is enough for question and answers. I know you probably have a lot more questions, but you can take all of those to your breakout groups. And if Anna Thornsley can just come up quickly and let you know what to do next. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna, for those of you that don't know me. Thank you to the panel. Um, so, And also thank you to those who were tweeting throughout the panel discussion. 
We're going to have breakout sessions now, and I'm sure you all have very busy days, but you can take your questions, as Shahima said, to the breakout session, have smaller group questions. We have a lot of great people talking. I'm just going to list very quickly what they are and where they're happening so you can get some directions, grab some water, grab some food, and head upstairs. The first one is population-specific pedagogy, finding a teaching style for a changing and diverse student body with Jess LeBlanc, and it's going to be on the third floor, classroom three north. You can take the stairs or the elevator. Um, the second is institutional accountability measures, evaluating data for student-focused program outcomes with Michelle Fine and Vanessa Anderson, Fine and Anderson, <laughs> classroom two south. Um, and the third is building the bridge to educational success for underrepresented students with Jarvis Watson and Eric Hoffman, which is going to be in classroom three south. So we really hope to see you there soon. They're going to go until 1130. Stay as long as you can. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you.